Great, so now we've gotten uh, fossilization out of the way. We know how fossils are formed. Let's talk a little bit about um, the Earth's geologic history, some of the chemical components of the atmosphere, and what they can tell us about the ancient past. When we're looking at geologic sediments, as we're looking at geologic uh, structures, we got to remember that the world isn't always as um, cut and dry as it seems to be. Sometimes, I know in the last lecture we said the bottom layer is the oldest, the top layer is the youngest, but sometimes the bottom layer is not as apparent as it should be. Sometimes you get these weird angles in rock formations, um, and those weird angles will uh, they'll confuse the aging of different um, fossils. So we can't rely fully on the positioning within the rock layers. Like we'll talk about positioning in the rock layers, but we can't rely on that fully. Sometimes we have to rely on more specific concrete metrics like radioisotope data. As far as um, positioning within the rocks, though, let's talk a little about um, how we can estimate ages. Usually, the youngest rock, uh, the youngest fossils will be in the higher layers of the sedimentary rock. As you drill down, you go deeper and deeper into time. But because of changes in the, um, the Earth, changes, geologic changes, those layers may be disturbed. And that could be due to upthrusting, continental drift, or subduction. So let's talk a little about the structure of the Earth, what the Earth is made of. See, the Earth seems solid to us. We're walking on solid ground. Everything is fine. Nothing is moving. Um, but the thing is, the Earth is constantly changing. It's just moving at a human scale, imperceptible motion. Um, figure the, the uh, imagine the Earth as a big ball. The outside of the ball seems solid, but it's not. Um, it's made up of different pieces that are actually floating or moving along a liquid underneath it. So you're gonna have this sort of solid crust on top uh, that's broken into pieces called plates. Underneath that, you're going to have um, a, a mantle, which is a little bit, uh, it's got a little bit of um, give to it, and then it gets a little bit, um, as you go deeper and deeper, you're going to get a more liquid until you reach what we have at the center of the Earth, which is a solid iron core. Um, there's an outer liquid core and then a solid interior iron core. That iron core spinning is what actually gives us our magnetic field so there you go but just like rafts on an ocean you've got this surface this uh, solid surface that's moving on a a slightly more liquid um subsurface that gives way to what's called pl plate tectonic theory continental drift is where those plates are constantly moving around. Um, in the Earth's ancient past, we were composed of just one landmass called Pangaea. Um, and then Pangaea split apart into different components and they started moving away and they're gonna come back together and they're gonna move away again and come back together. And this has happened several times. Um, continental drift is what accounts for uh, what, what we saw with Darwin where the same fossils that are on one at the uh, western edge of Africa, the exact same that you would find on the eastern edge of South America. The continents are splitting apart at roughly the rate that your thumbnail grows. Um, so not very fast, but eventually they will collide into each other or move away from each other, and that will lead to different geologic formations. One formation you get when these plates are running into each other is what's known as upthrusting. The two plates will collide and then push upward against each other, shifting the um, mountains up, which in turn will make the, uh, the rock layers uh, shift to an angle. So you might have them facing upwards or maybe even doing a complete reverse. That will change the order of the rock layers so the youngest is not on top uh, anymore. Another way that these... Um, that, that continental drift can impact the uh, geologic structures is through subduction. With subduction, you have two plates running into each other and one plate slides right underneath the other one. 
Now that creates a lot of friction, and friction leads to heat. Uh, it could end up uh, liquefying some of the rocks and turning it into magma. So you're going to have a lot of pressure building up right where those two plates are colliding, one sliding into the other. The magma will rise to the surface, and you end up with volcanism. So you'll see a lot of mountain formation right along subduction zones, say, in the uh, Pacific Ocean, or along the Pacific Ocean. So we can't always use the position that fossils are in the rocks to figure out how old they are. Instead, we might want to use um, radioisotope dating. Now, to get radioisotope dating, we have to understand radioactive decay. With radioactive decay, an isotope of one element in any given amount of time will, at a steady rate, break down into a different, form, uh, a different isotope, either of that element or of an entirely different element. Now, radioactive decay gives off a lot of heat. Um, broadly, the way you're going to get um, radioisotope formation is by using high-energy radiation. So we can study that consistent breakdown of one material into another. We can study its what's called half-life, the amount of time it takes for half of a given element of a substance to change from one isotope into another. So over a set amount of time, if you start off with one pound, you will end up with one pound of some substance, it will turn into half of a pound of that substance. That is its half-life. And then over a given amount of time, half of half of that substance will turn into a different substance to leave you with a quarter of the original substance. And you can use that steady rate to mathematically determine how old or how long ago it was that you had 100% of that substance. So we need to figure out what the correct or what the best element is for figuring out how old our fossils are. Because we can always um, use this radioisotope dating, use this mathematical method of going backwards in time um, to figure out how old uh, a particular rock is. Now, uranium, which is U-238, breaks down into lead, 208, in 4.5 billion years. So its half-life is literally the age of the Earth. We know that pure uranium will break down into half of that substance being lead in 4.3 billion years. Um, another type of uranium, uranium-235, will break down to lead 207 in 704 million years. So that's a little bit better. Um, so its half-life is 704 million years. So within 704 million years, you would go from having one pound of U-235 to uh, half a pound of U-235 and half a pound of lead 207. That makes it a little bit easier to start dating the earliest fossils on the planet. Um, here's uh, potassium. Uh, will break down to argon in 1.25 billion years. Um, rubidium will break down to strontium in 48.8 billion years, which is considerably older than our sun and not terribly useful to us. But look at this carbon-14 here. Carbon-14 will break down into uh, nitrogen-14 in 5,700 years. Well, now we're dealing with a good um, isotope to use to study human remains, to study uh, human civilization. Because human civilizations have only been, you know, recognizable humans have only been around for a few tens of thousands of years, and that's not even all the way up to us. So we can use carbon to figure out uh, or to date some of these fossils that we're dealing with, especially that are um, younger fossils. Now, we're not actually going to test the fossil itself. Usually what we test... Um, instead of a fossil, is igneous rock that's contemporary with the fossil. You don't want to destroy your fossil in the process just to figure out how old it is. So instead, you pick a rock that's in the same strata, and you test that. Now, we tend to use igneous rock. The reason we use igneous rocks is because they come from ancient lava flows. Now, lava flows contain uranium, but they contain no lead. So you get a pure lead sample, which means... Once you've gotten, if there's any lead that's present, and you figure out the amount of uh, uranium compared to the amount of lead, you're then able to calculate the half-life for that particular structure. 
Um, it's going to give you not entirely precise, but it'll give you within a few hundred thousand years or within a hundred thousand years um, for uranium. And that's a, a pretty accurate time frame considering how long the Earth has been um, around. So we turn this U-235, no, well, we don't do it. U-235 slowly breaks down into uh, lead. And then we can look at those ratios to determine um, the age of the rock. Again, the one we typically use for human uh, contemporary fossils is going to be carbon-14. Uh, you've probably heard of carbon, da carbon dating is what they also call it. Carbon-14 is usually used for fossils that are less than 50,000 years old. Now, the reason carbon-14 is so cool is because um, basically you're going to have in the outer atmosphere lots and lots of radiation. Um, to create carbon-14, you're going to have to excite carbon. So you've got this gamma radiation that's going to come in in the outer atmosphere. We've got a lot of high energy that's not protecting, you know, not protected by the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, gamma ray strikes the atom. It splits it, releasing a beta particle that can then start this sort of billiard chain reaction when it enters the atmosphere. Because now you've got um, a, a neutron Coming in, it strikes a uh, it'll strike say a carbon. I'm sorry, it'll strike a carbon. No, it'll strike a nitrogen. Sorry, I had to think it through. It strikes nitrogen. That that will knock a proton out of the nitrogen. So now the nitrogen has picked up a neutron, um, but lost a proton. If it lost a proton, it also lost its identity as nitrogen and becomes carbon. But it's carbon with a little bit more mass than that extra neutron. So it's become carbon-14 instead of carbon-12. That carbon-14 exists in a certain ratio in the atmosphere, a known ratio in the atmosphere. Your body, well, not your body, let's talk about plants. Plants will take in that carbon-14 from the atmosphere. They're going to um, convert it into sugar. So that carbon is going to be taken out of the atmosphere and fixed into a sugar. It's still, um, it, you know, it, 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 and then the plant's going to use that sugar to build new structures, or you'll eat the plant and take in that carbon-14 and use that carbon-14 to build parts of your body. Then you die, and when you die, you're no longer taking in any new carbon-14. So the amount of carbon-14 in your body is fixed, and it's fixed at that ratio of... Um, what uh, what uh, uh, the, that atmospheric ratio? So as you die and you're no longer taking in any more carbon-14, you begin to decompose, you begin to break down, uh, you might get fossilized. Any carbon-14 that was trapped in your body will slowly, over thousands of years, begin to break down following its half-life. So in thousands of years, when your body's dug up or your remains are recovered. We can then determine exactly when it was that you died, not necessarily when you lived, but when you died, because at the moment of your death, uh, that carbon-14 level was fixed, and it was slowly breaking down following its half-life that can be calculated backwards. So that's how we can get some fairly accurate ideas of how old uh, these fossils are. It gives us direct proof that the Earth is much, much older than we uh, originally thought. 300 years ago. So as we go back to um, paleontology and fossilization, you'll notice that um, fossils, uh, I'm sorry, paleontology in general is biased. As we examine the file, fossil record, we're going to see a whole bunch of bias based on organism's anatomy, the size of the organism, how many of that organism were present on Earth at the time, uh, the environment it was fossilized in, um, whether it's more recent or more ancient, the geology of the area, and in fact, you know, just paleontology as a field, all of these introduce new levels of bias. Uh, anatomy. Some organisms with hard parts are more likely to be preserved. You're more likely to find the shell of a turtle than you are to find the, the skin of a jellyfish. In general, hard parts are preserved easier. So we'll see a lot of insects. 
We'll see a lot of shells. We'll see a lot of, um, yeah, of, of, of bivalves. Uh, we don't see as many worms or soft-bodied things. Size is another um, bias. We tend to find a lot more larger organisms than smaller ones. Um, on the left, you see an elephant. We're going to find a big elephant because when you're digging, it's way easier to recognize the bones or the remains of a large organism than it would be for a microscopic water flea. We don't have as much in the way of um, fossils of smaller organisms. The number. Some species exist in very large numbers in a large geographic range. Think of this top organism, a cow. They exist all over the world. The odds of a future scientist finding a cow are much higher than it would be finding this glass frog of Madagascar. The cow has a geographic range widely distributed, so there's a much greater chance of finding it compared to the glass frog that lives in a one or two square mile region of Madagascar. You'd have to look in a very particular place and get very, very lucky to find the one place on Earth that this frog happened to live. Uh, the environment. Uh, organisms in water, as we talked about with erosion, are more likely to get fossilized than organisms on dry land. Water plays a major role in the fossilization process. Um, so if an organism lives on the dry land, it's less likely to be fossilized than an organism that lives on, in the water or at least near a water source. Organisms that, are, uh, that died more recently are more likely, we are more likely to find their remains in organisms that lived a long, long time ago. Further, organisms that lived over a long time frame are more likely to be found than organisms that lived during a very short time frame. Humans have only been around for you know, 40,000 years. Uh, the, the recognizable sauropods were around for millions upon millions of years. We are more likely to find their remains than something that was sort of around for a geologic brief uh, flash in the pan. Some organisms fossilize easier just because of the chemistry. Uh, for instance, trilobites fossilize very, very easily because the, uh, their shells attracted ions, which in turn um, sort of held the, uh, the sediment closer to them. It held it together to create these great casts and molds. So sometimes the chemistry associated with an organism's body helps preserve them even more. And then with paleontology, um, we get paleontology is not a lucrative field. People don't want to pay to send other people out to find dinosaurs uh, or dinosaur parts if they don't if you don't know where to look. You don't just go out in your yard. Although when you were younger, you probably went out in your yard to look for dinosaur fossils. Um, usually in paleontology, you look for dinosaur fossils or any type of fossil where you've already found fossils before. And that means that some areas get extremely well studied. Um, and we get a, a bias as to what we believe was in that area. So um, say the La Brea Tar Pits, there are a lot of fossils from there. We've studied it in depth. There's a lot of money that would go toward looking at that stuff. There's less money out there to do exploratory studies, to find new areas where dinosaurs might be, or, or, or these uh, ancient organisms. So typically, there's a bias in where we look for these organisms, because there's no money to just do exploration unless you already have an idea that an organism will be found. So there we go. We understand the broad history of the earth that over time there's a lot of continental movement there uh, that can lead to different geologic events we can uh, have understood the fossilization process we can understand how fossils can tell us a little bit about the ancient world um, we've also talked about bias in um, in paleontology and in fossils which might shift the scales. So there may be periods of time where we thought there were not many organisms, but it just happens that during that period, maybe the organisms were very soft-bodied and didn't fossilize well. So we cannot know about exactly what the ancient past was like. 
all we can do is use these clues to piece it together and create our best uh, reconstruction of the past. We'll never be able to prove it was true, but we can do our best to learn, uh, understand the past and hopefully learn from um, the way the world has changed over time.